In the summer after sophomore year at Princeton, Jonathan Safran Ford journeyed to the Ukraine. He had hoped to find the woman who rescued his grandfather during World War II. While he was unable to do so, he decided to write a fictional story based on his experiences. The result is a 25-year-old's first novel. Everything is Illuminated is one of the publishing world's biggest stories of the season. The New York Times calls it a dazzling literary high-wire act and a fearless, acrobatic, ultimately haunting effort. I am pleased to welcome Jonathan Safran Ford to this table uh, in the context of all of this rave. So the question is, how did you do it? I mean, you're 25, you're right out of Princeton, uh, you go to the Ukraine and you come back and you have all these people falling all over themselves saying how great this is. I think the question is, what is it? Um, the it that you're referring to is a novel. And in fact, that's not really what I intended to do. What I intended to do was find out about my family and find out about myself and then somehow express what I found out. So in a way, I ended up somewhere other than where I was trying to end up. And I, I became very lucky. Think so? Lucky? Yeah, I do think so in a couple different ways. One of which is that uh, this kind of expression that I had, this, these feelings inside of me that I was then able to put on the outside of me took the form of a book, took the form of something that's readable and maybe funny at times and maybe moving at times. Um, and it didn't have to be that way. Um, it could have been the case that this expression took the form of a conversation with a friend or something that I could never share with anybody. Mm. So uh, you had something to say and rather than expressing it in a conversation with a friend, you put it in a book. Yeah. But still, that says something about the quality of what you had to say, or the passion, or something about what you have to say. Lots of people write books, and then they realize they've got nothing to say. Mm. Yeah, it's true. I, I, you know, I'm never sure what it is. I never thought that I had anything to say. I, I, it's not as if I felt, um, I felt sometimes like I was a, a you know, imagine I was a stereo system. It's not that there was a particular song that I wanted to play. It's that I wanted to test the speakers and have volume coming out of them. Yeah. So in my effort to make the book, I never thought of it as a story that I had to tell. I thought of it more as an activity that I had to do. You know, like a beaver, they say uh, beavers cut down trees to make dams for two different reasons. One of which is to dam up the water. Yeah. And the other reason is if they don't, their teeth will grow into their own mouths and they will literally you know, die of yes, this. Yes. And so while so part of it might have been to create a novel, the other part was I just had to get it out. Tell me how it began. It's a good question. Um, the most ex explicit, the, the most straightforward explanation and probably the most honest explanation is that it began with a trip that I made in the summer after my sophomore year at college to the Ukraine. I went for three days and I was looking for uh, a woman whom I've been told had saved my grandfather during the war. I went for three days and I found absolutely nothing. I didn't find the woman. I wasn't even close to finding the woman. Um, and I didn't even find the kind of absence that I was anticipating. It wasn't an evocative absence. It wasn't a moving experience. It was just nothing. And then I spent t the following 10 weeks in Prague and in those 10 weeks, I, I wrote a draft of this book, which I then edited for several years. But this, ex, this like the, the creative thrust all happened in a very short period in of time. In 10 days in Prague. 10 weeks 10 in Prague. 10 weeks in Prague, I mean, yeah. 10 days, and then I, then I would be in great shape. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? I mean, I'm not sure how much ground there is to plow hill, but I mean, there is something that went on that led to this. I mean, it is the core of this, whatever happened in 10 weeks in Prague. Yeah, it's the it's the the biggest question of my life. the the biggest The biggest two questions are what happened and how can I make it happen again. Um, I don't know that I can answer what happened. All I know is that I felt like in those ten weeks I was more honest with myself than I've ever been before. Um, in part because, as I said, I wasn't trying to do anything. I wasn't mm -hmm. trying to write a novel. I wasn't trying to look smart. I wasn't even trying to be funny. I was just trying to pursue these things that I felt and trying to uh, make myself vulnerable mm -hmm. and just expose everything in front of me that had been kept inside of me. And so now when I think of how to replicate it, and I haven't replicated it, 
the, the thing that I come back to is how can I be more honest? How, how can I make myself more vulnerable? How can you create the circumstances that led to this experience? Right. And how hard do you try to do that? I mean, how do you go about trying to do that? There are a couple different ways. One of which is just simply, I go to the, the library, yeah. I open my laptop, and I sit there, regardless of whether or not I feel like it. Um, I gave a reading at a high school the other day, and one of the students asked, what do you do when you don't feel inspired? And I said, I've never in my life felt inspired. It's, it's not a question of inspiration. It's a question of this mundane, or this seemingly mundane act of will. I just go, and I've committed myself to this project of trying to be honest. And it's, it's not like a glorious revelation. It's an incredibly difficult, frustrating, um, self-deprecating act. Um, but I go and I do it, and that's how it happens. What kind of kid were you? Pretty rambunctious. <laughs> uh, very... You're not someone who said, someday I'm going to write the great American novel. No. Or someone no. <laughs> that wasn't you. Maybe I you. thought someday I'll steal the great American novel from a bookstore. <laughs> I, Sorry. I used to... Or I'll uh, sleep on the great American novel. <laughs> right. or, or I'll sleep with the great American novel. Right. Yeah. A you great American to... novelist. I, I, would, um, I was very flamboyant. And I would wear these crazy outfits with, yeah. um, I, my mother just sent me a picture the other day. <laughs> I was like six years old and I had these rings on every single finger and a bow tie and a vest that was made of a glitter material and a plaid sport jacket. And I think that's what I was like. I mm. would just walk around like that and I thought, I don't know, it, I don't think it was ever that I wanted to proclaim any sort of uniqueness. I just liked the idea of things being a bit elevated, of things being more. You were how old when you went to you you went to Princeton at eighteen. Right. You know, got out twenty two, I assume, like everybody right. else. You, know. right. you went to the Ukraine when you were twenty three. No, you went 20. to twenty in your sophomore year. Yeah. Uh, and while you then while in Prague you know, for ten weeks, this happens. Did did anything in you say because you read a lot of books, because you were had a sense of what writing was about, did anything in you say, This is good. This is somehow however this happened. Whatever the convergence was, the end result is the core of something good. Yes, but I don't think I thought of it as a good book. I think I thought of it as a very good experience and a good start. Um, I think of, you know, I don't think of myself as a writer right now. I think a writer is somebody who writes many books and, you know, in the course of a career, goes through several very dramatic changes right, right, right. and is someone who's durable. And the best example of that recently was Reynolds Price was here. Mm. Reynolds Price has written 34 books. Mm. <laughs> you know, he's gotten lots of praise for them. He was a Rhodes Scholar. He's written essays. He started off with a great first book. He must go to Prague a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think it happened in North Carolina. Okay. Maybe it happened. I should go there. Maybe it happened in when he, but, but it, you're right. He is a writer. He can say, I'm a writer. Yeah. You know, he gets up every day and every couple of years a book comes out. Mm. I, I've written a book, yeah. but I felt very aware when I wrote the book that I was embarking on something that was long, that, that was m much more ambitious than the book, and that was going to take a lot more time than the book would take. And that was finding this woman, no, or something no, no, else? no. That was um, committing my life to this kind of expression, right? Um, committing myself to being vulnerable, committing myself to this very specific kind of honesty. You know, there are many kinds of honesty. This is just well, one. I mean, I've, I must say this to you. You have a powerful sense of self-understanding, it seems to me. I mean, for someone uh, of your age, you really do have a grasp on terms of being able to express. You know, you, obviously that's true because of this. And it's reflected in this. It's reflected in a conversation. Uh, can you tell me a little more about what happened in Prague that was so powerful? It was kind of like a love affair. And, and, and I think... It might be as hard to describe as would be a love affair. Um, it was really amazing. I felt more alive than I've ever felt, ever felt before, and probably ever felt since. I felt that things were more important than they had ever been before. Um, I was thinking all of the time. And I don't mean thinking deep thoughts. I mean thinking, hey, this is neat the way that the road is sort of slanted toward the middle. Or isn't it kind of neat how the trolleys work here? Everything felt um, significant, and 
I think that my my version of of how I think about art is is not it's again it has nothing to do with inspiration or muses. It's finding significance in in mundane things and and celebrating that. And I just I think that's w what happened. Why two voices? Why two voices? Um, so the book is split between right. this history of the village right. and a contemporary search to find this um, to find the village. And I felt that I needed to approach one story. I felt that it wasn't really one story I was telling. I was telling um, perspectives. Uh, I was giving perspectives on one story. In fact, there's no definitive version told in this book. It's kind of the sad um, deflation of the title, Everything is Illuminated. Nothing is really illuminated at the end of the book, except that um, everybody sees things in different ways. And I think every character in the book is writing a version of something, is telling a story about something. Um, and you know, most explicitly, there are these two huge braids that move together through the book, uh, telling the story of what happens. And, and, and a large part of it is just that we don't know. You know, there, there are two different ways that you can describe everyday activities, one of which is like very simple, straightforward, physically, like I move this glass across this table and water is being transported in this cylindrical container and that's what happened. But another way to describe things is this is how it feels when I move this glass across the table. You know, it's kind of cold on my hands and I'm watching the water vibrate in it and it reminds me of when I went to the beach when I was a kid with my parents. And this book appeals to the second version of storytelling. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about the second version is it, it's not definitive because as I moved it across and if I were to ask you what was your experience of that? You know, you would not say the water reminded you of the beach when I was a kid. You would have your own take on it. Yeah, and that's so. Me, it, it is what, it, what. What does it resonate with in your own memory? Yeah, and 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 so these. I had these two voices because. Um, the story I wanted to tell was the story of retellings, rather than any sort of reference story. By the title. Why the title? Um, because a couple of reasons. One is there's a scene in the book that it explicitly refers to, in which this kind of um, pseudo scientific theory is put forth, in which all of the it, it says that when people make love, you can see it from space as a tiny little spark of light, and on Valentine's Day you can see New York City from space, and on St. Patrick's Day you can see Dublin. And for the eight nights of Hanukkah, you can see Jerusalem. And I'm describing this one particular day in the history of the village. And it's the only day all year when you can see the village from space. Um, it's this great celebration, and everybody is proclaiming their existence right. with this love. Um, so explicitly, it's that. But also, you know, the word illuminated is a kind of complicated word. Um, it has to do with revelation and with uncovering and with things that were once obscure becoming clear and in a way the book traces that arc from obscurity to clarity although it turns out the clarity is not what we thought it was going to be the dedication is simply and impossibly for my family simply and impossibly meaning meaning two things one is it's the most easy thing in the world to give it's the, it's the most fundamental thing about me. Um, this is the equivalent of, the, it, it's the artistic equivalent of having a map of my genetic code. And there's nothing more primary about me than this book. Impossibly, because you can't give anybody everything. And in a way, the act of writing it was beautiful and terribly frustrating because I realized that you know, only through words and through storytelling can I approach it, this thing that I want to express. And I also realized that I will never get there. Um, I think that, you know, the more time one spends around language, the more one realizes its shortcomings. And also, simply and impossibly, I wanted to give it to people who aren't alive. Um, you know, it's the very simple gesture of one generation wanting to express gratitude to another and the impossibility of doing it because previous generations 
have been killed or have died of natural causes. If I go outside this room and I give this book to someone, what will they know about, and they go read it, what will they know about you? That's a great question. Uh, what will they think they know about yeah. me? I think they will think that I, um, you know, I've asked this of people, actually, people that I don't know very well, because I'm curious. It's really an interesting question. And people have said, I would think you're funny. People have said, I would think you're probably some sort of sexual pervert. Um, <laughs> they're not necessarily right on either account. Um, and I think... Partially right? <laughs> I'm partially fun funny? I'm partially funny, anyway. And I think, I would hope, above all things, they would say, this is somebody who, who feels things deeply and um, who's making an effort to, to communicate that. And maybe above all, all things, they would say, I think the person who wrote this is sort of like me. Yeah, they say, that's it. That's it. I think. I mean, I think I mean, that if, 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 if that's why people will re respond to it, because somehow it touches something that is within them. They think that he's telling my story, or he is in mm. part I think he's that, giving expression to feelings that I have that I have n neither the command of language or the skill to do. The deepest human interaction is um, recognizing something, something about yourself and someone else. Exactly. Um, I was on. I was doing a radio interview the other day, and I had. Uh, it was Colin, and the person said, "I just want to thank you for this book. Um, you told my story. You expressed these things that I had been unable to express. Um, I have, you know, a closet of family secrets that is never opened, and now I feel more prepared to open it." I said, "Thank you so much. I couldn't have wanted anything more from the book." And he said, "You know, being a, a 35-year-old black guy in Philadelphia," and I thought, "Oh my God." Um, I thought, <laughs> it was a revelation to me because one assumes that recognizability is easier when the circumstances are more similar. Right. But in fact, I think there's something much deeper going on, um, something much more human and less circumstantial. And that happened with this person. And that single call justified every effort I ever made to, to write this book. To write this book. That some one person out there of dissimilar demographics found the common chord. Mm. And then I recognized him. It's not a one-way You thing. did? Yeah. I mean, what did you recognize? <sighs> I'm not sure it's something I can describe so easily, except that I felt a connection that wasn't there before I had spoken to him. Um, the world, after that phone call, was a smaller place than it was before the phone call. And this is what art can aspire to. Um, I don't have anything great to say about you know, how to solve the problems in the Middle East. I don't have anything great to say about um, you know, fixing the welfare system. What I do know is that a lot of problems in the world stem from a lack of compassion. There's just not enough compassion. The world is a little bit too big. And in that phone call, there was a moment of compassion that was enabled by the book. The book became you know, a table like this one over which this person and I could talk. Um, and that's the most that I can ever hope to do. And that he would recognize that and that I would then feel a kind of reciprocal closeness is wonderful. In the end, did you simply, I'd say frequently to people, you know, the most important story you can ever tell is your story. It's obvious and, and basic and fundamental, but that's what you've done and somebody finds in your story his story or her story. What, what's the gender difference in reaction? I don't know. Um, I really don't know. I know that in terms of people who have approached me, it's more women. And I, I don't know. I think, I think that women tend to be more open with expressing themselves. Um, and, and more open to, you know, a more risky kind of communication. In the opening page, I think it is, that Alex refers to Jonathan Safran Foer as the hero of the story. Mm. What's that about? Well, there's this dual movement where Jonathan begins as the hero and ends up as a kind of 
um, fool. And Alex begins as the fool and ends up as a kind of hero. And I think it draws attention to the, something we were talking about earlier, which is that there are these different versions going on. We think that we are reading Jonathan's book in the beginning. We think that the journey we're being taken on is Jonathan's. Mm. And at the end, we are not so sure of that. Um, it sure seems like it's Alex's book and it's Alex's journey. So n none of the positions in the book, father, son, hero, fool, Jew, Gentile, no nothing is fixed. And I don't know that there are any characters who end with the same title they begin with. You know, Alex's first line is, my legal name is Alexander Perchov. And then he gives an archive of the various other names he has. My father calls me this, my mother calls me this, my girlfriend calls me this, my little brother calls me this. And it's making explicit what's going to happen, which is we have to start picking names. Um, and, you know, uh, asserting, asserting ourselves. And so it, it starts out as a kind of joke. Jonathan is the hero. We know it's a joke. But then the, the, the bottom falls out of it. And at the end, we're left to ask, well, who, who are these people? Everything is illuminated, Jonathan Safran IV. Uh, just to give you a, some sense of, of what people are saying about this, Janet Madison said, as we noted, a dazzling literary high-wire act, a brilliant, the payoff is extraordinary, a fearless, acrobatic, ultimately haunting effort. Time Magazine, a certified wonder kind at 25. I shouldn't read this to you, should I? <laughs> a funny, moving, deeply felt novel about the dangers of confronting the past and the redemption that comes with laughing at it, even when that seems all but impossible. In Esquire, one of the most impressive first novels in a long time. This book is, as its name implies, brilliant. Francine Prose, the New York Times book review, not since Anthony Burgess's A Clockwork Orange has the English language been simultaneously mauled and energized with such brilliance and such brio. And Adam Begley in the New York Observer, it's wonderful to think that the very young Jonathan Safran Foer can be writing so well and with such lofty aspiration. It will be wonderful if he writes many more books. And so it will. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Pleasure. In the summer after sophomore year at Princeton, Jonathan Safran Ford journeyed to the Ukraine. He had hoped to find the woman who rescued his grandfather during World War II. While he was unable to do so, he decided to write a fictional story based on his experiences. The result is a 25-year-old's first novel. Everything is illuminated as one of the publishing world's biggest stories of the season. The New York Times calls it a dazzling literary high-wire act and a fearless, acrobatic, ultimately haunting effort. I am pleased to welcome Jonathan Safran Ford to this table uh, in the context of all of this rave. So the question is, how did you do it? I mean, you're 25, you're right out of Prince. Reasons, one of which is to dam up the water. Yeah. And the other reason is, if they don't, their teeth will grow into their own mouths and they will literally you know, die of yes, this. Yes. And so while so part of it might have been to create a novel, the other part was I just had to get it out. Tell me how it began. It's a good question. Um, the most ex explicit, the, the most straightforward explanation and probably the most honest explanation is that it began with a trip that I made in the summer after my sophomore year at college to the Ukraine. I went for three days and I was looking for something about what you have to say. Lots of people write books and then they realize they've got nothing to say. Mm. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm never sure what it is. I never thought that I had anything to say. I, I, it's not as if I felt, um, I felt sometimes like I was a, a, you know, imagine I was a stereo system. It's not that there was a particular song that I wanted to play. It's that I wanted to test the speakers and have volume coming out of them. Mm. So. In my effort to make the book, I never thought of it as a story that I had to tell. I thought of it more as an activity that I had to do. You know, like a beaver. They say uh, beavers cut down trees to make dams for two different reasons. Uh, you go to the Ukraine and you come back and you have all these people falling all over themselves saying how great this is. I think the question is what is it? Um, the it that you're referring to is a novel. And in fact, that's not really what I intended to do. What I intended to do was find out about my family and find out about myself and then somehow express what I found out. So in a way, I ended up somewhere other than 
where I was trying to end up, and I, I became very lucky. Think so? Lucky? Yeah, I do think so, in a couple different ways, one of which is that uh, this kind of expression that I had, this, these feelings inside of me that I was then able to put on the outside of me, took the form of a book, took the form of something that's readable and maybe funny at times and maybe moving at times. Um, and it didn't have to be that way. Um, it could have been the case that this expression took the form of a conversation with a friend or something that I could never share with anybody. Mm. So uh, you had something to say and rather than expressing it in a conversation with a friend, you put it in a book. Yeah. But still, that says something about the quality of what you had to say or the passion. Or